Hey everybody, welcome back. This is my second uh, YouTube live and um, I announced this one actually to my mailing list. So um, I am ready to roll and it uh, looks like there's a few people here waiting, which is awesome. Um, I know and be aware of this, that there's about a 10 second lag between when you uh, answer or type a comment and when it actually shows up on my screen. So that is something you have to be aware of. And um, so I want to welcome you all. This is awesome. This is, like I said, it's my second live. Um, it's beautiful, sunny Saturday. And I thought I would try this at midday on a weekend to see how many more people might be available. And um, so here we go. Click to view comments. Let's see what we're going on. There we go. Kotz Inc. Hey, how are you? Good. Welcome. Um, still figuring out the interface just a little bit. Um, and I want to try something, Kotz. I want to see this ad to broadcast. Yeah, this. Uh, if I click on your comment, then it pops onto the screen. And I'm going to try to figure out how that works. Cool. So that way, when people ask a question, if I want to post it onto the screen so people can know what question I'm talking about, when they uh, come into the broadcast, then they can see, you know, what the question is. So that's some functionality of this program, Ecamm Live, which I use, which interfaces with YouTube. Um, it's a great program, If and I'm not even an affiliate yet, so I'm, I'm hawking it without any... Um, uh, chance of getting compensated for that. Um, but uh, like I said, it's my second live. So I'm still tr kind of figuring out the interface a little bit and how the comment section works in relation to the screen and what I see and what I can put on my screen and what I can't. Um, so there are comments popping up on my screen too. Um, and I want to see if I can move those, but it doesn't look like I can. Hey, um, Josiga, Diego, Shane, um, Valia, Zoom, Giuseppe, uh, Nissan, Morjane. How are you guys? Awesome. I'm so stoked that you decided to, to join me here. Um, this is great. My first live was amazing. I didn't even announce it. And um, about 80 people showed up over the two hours that I was there, um, which was awesome. So you guys either have just seen this pop up and you're just showing up or you got my announcement uh, through my email list and um, knew I was coming on. So as I said in my email and also what's on the screen right here, um, I'm just going to be taking questions today. Ask me anything. Uh, questions uh, on branding, marketing, design, entrepreneurship, um, creative professional careers, those are my areas of expertise and those are uh, things that I um, uh, talk about on my channel. And so one of the things um, I wanted to point out, and I'm actually going to throw this up on the screen because it's not there yet, um, is, sorry, uh, it is, sorry. My email list thing, but yeah, there's a, um, sorry, there's something that I could put on the front of the screen that said, type your question in all caps. So if you have a question, um, please type it in all caps. Um, so I can see it as it shows up in my feed. Um, and I had a graphic that said that, and for some reason it has disappeared. Um, so if anyone can help me moderate um, the comment section, if people are asking questions and they're not asking it in all caps, if you could just suggest that they do, I'd really appreciate that. Um, Jagoda, hey, I know it's super late for you and you can only be here half an hour. So uh, it's good to see you too. Thanks for connecting with me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, where are you actually? I'm just kind of curious how where you are that it's so late. Paul, Dana, Sheila, Dario, um, E, I'm sorry, um, Timit Pot, I can't pronounce your first name. Um, Laura, Noah, uh, P. Shrimpton. Um, so what's the best way to follow up? Make sure that you preface your question with the word question in all caps, because that way I can recognize it. Um, 
What's the best way to follow up with the client if you have sent a proposal to? Um, if you send a proposal to them and you haven't heard back in two or three days, um, I would shoot them an email. If you haven't heard back in a week, I would call them. Um, I'm actually in that situation right now. I put in a proposal for a large naming project for a .com and um, they're taking their time. Um, sometimes when they get a proposal, it may raise questions in their mind in terms of, you know, what's, you know, whether they really want to go forward with it, whether the scope that they gave you is actually the scope that they want. When they get a price, sometimes they have to get their clear, that cleared through their organization. So sometimes it takes some time. Um, copyright or trademark on your logos, which is best. Um, trademarking is very expensive to do and it, you need a lawyer to actually um, do trademark searches uh, nationally and internationally for trademark and it takes a long time it's very expensive to do it lawyers generally cost anywhere from you know two grand to five grand to do a trademark search in terms of copyright everything that you design everything you design as long as you put copyright and the year on it it's copyrighted you own the copyright as the creator of that. Um, but if you're doing logos for other people, like when I do logos for other companies, I sell the rights to that logo to that company. I don't own any of the rights. It's work for hire and they own the copyright and the intellectual property of the logos that I designed for them. If it's a logo, my logo, then if I've designed it for me, then I own the copyrights on it. Um, thanks, Laura. I appreciate, I really appreciate you doing that. Um, that moderation for me. I got to figure out why that thing I typed and was on my screen is no longer on my screen. Um, so, uh, could you talk about reinventing a design career? Mark, that is a big, big question. Um, if, you know, when it comes to reinvention, if you've been have, if you've not been doing design and you're getting into design, that's kind of just the launch of a new career. But if you're reinventing your design career, you may need to rebrand yourself, redo your website, redo your visual identity, redo how you talk about yourself, um, redo your portfolio. Um, if you're reinvigorating your career or going into you know a new capability set, then you're going to want to push out the things from your previous kind of direction and creative and fill your portfolio with the new stuff. Cause this is something I talked about last time, which is really important, which is in your portfolio, when you're showing it to clients or when you're showing it to companies you want to work for, you only want to show the work that you want to get. Um, because if you show the smorgasbord of 10 million things that you do, yeah. You, hey, Kathy, Kathy Onetto showed up. Oh, that's so cool. Kathy is a partner of mine um, and uh, in my agency, and she is a strategy freaking rock star. Um, so Kathy Onetto, look her up. She's on LinkedIn. She publishes. She has an amazing um, uh, uh, blog called the Weather Vane Forum. Uh, amazing around trend and marketing um, insights. Um, so she's awesome. You should check her out. Um, and so I hope that helps in terms of the reinvigoration of the design career. Advice, when editing and creating a video for social, is it best to just get it out, except it's not going to be perfect, evolve as you go along, and, or spend time and have some structure? Having structure in terms of how your video is organized, um, you know, what you're saying, how you're saying it, how long your videos are, how you go about doing the consistent presentation of your videos, that's structure, what I see as structure. Um, and, uh, the, the one thing I would say in terms of perfection and getting it out, I am all about get it out. Like perfectionism is the creativity killer. People want everything to be perfect. And no matter what, no matter what you do, the first time you do something, it's going to suck a little bit and you're going to get better over time. So why not just get it out there? Because so many people just wait and they just don't start. One of my biggest mottos that I talk about all the time is just start, just get going. Because as soon as you get going, it's starting that process of growth and change. And um, you learn so much along the way, technically in terms of production and what you do or don't do. Speaking of which, hey, there you go. View number two, when I did my first live video, I had two views. Actually, when I did my first 150 YouTube videos, I had one camera view and I cheated and I you know, zoomed in and out and I moved it a little bit to create some visual interest for the talking head. But in the last next four videos that I have coming up, I used two cameras. One was a webcam 
It's not a perfect camera. It's a little different focus, but it adds a little bit of visual interest to what I'm doing. So, you know, I did 150 videos before I even like figured out or took the step of doing a second camera view. So, you know, get out there, do it, you know, have it not be perfect. Minimum viable product for everything. Um, that is my motto. Um, so I'm going to switch back. There you go. See? Um, okay. Uh, what do you think of so many websites using the continuous scroll? Uh, here's the thing. The one thing about websites is that every time you have to change, go to a different page in navigation, you lose about 50% of your viewers. That's like a fact. So if you are forcing someone to go to another page of your website, either through a link or something else, you have that 50% chance, if not more of losing them. So I get the continuous scroll thing because if you can be on one page and you can get all the information on that page, or if you click a link at the top and it just scrolls down to the bottom of the page to the section that you want, I think that's it's pretty, um, it's pretty uh, um, um, efficient. Um, and, and it cuts off a little bit that ability to possibly lose somebody. Hey Shane, you're welcome. Really appreciate your question. What are the best books on design? Noah, that's a great question. And in every single one of the descriptions of my videos, I have a list of probably 20 or 30 books in design and marketing that I think are fantastic. Start there. When you've read them all, come back and ask the question again. I've also got a ton of, you know, books in my office I could pull off the shelves, but a lot of them are in that list. Um, hey, Paulo. Portugal. Awesome. Um, Galeria. Um, I'm glad that I'm a good resource for you and for useful content. I and appreciate all of you guys showing up. I know it's Saturday. It was going to be interesting to me to, to see whether there were like a lot of people who were going to show up because it's a weekend or a few. Um, you know, I went on live a week ago, um, totally unannounced on Friday at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or something like that. And like all these people showed up. So Either it was the time of day or people just didn't want to work and they just wanted to watch something live. Maybe people have like a lot of stuff going on this weekend. I don't know. Um, Jai, um, I hope that's how I pronounce it, Dana. Um, how do you go about starting your design business? Wow. I, some of these questions are so huge. But um, how do you go about starting a design business? Well, first of all, you got to learn the craft. You have to learn how to design then you have to put together a body of work. So a body of work around what it is that you want to do, develop a portfolio. Next step, I would say you have to get some sort of digital presence online, a website, put your portfolio on there, um, get some good descriptive copy of what it is that you do, um, what you're special, you know, specialist at, whether you do copy or video or animation or graphic design or logo or layout or you know, app design, UX, UI, whatever it is that you do. Get that online. Make sure it's on your uh, LinkedIn profile as well. And then start networking, start making connections. Um, and that was something actually I wanted to talk about today if the conversation gets slow at any point, um, is about how to develop your network and some ideas I have around developing your network and reaching out to people. Because one of the things that I've been having to happen to me a lot recently is people are reaching out to me via email and they're telling me like their life story and sending me their portfolio in a PDF or a website and saying, go into my website, look at my portfolio, review my work, please tell me what I need to do. And that's very one-sided. Number one, it's a huge ask of me just out of the gate and I don't even know who you are. And so there are ways of going about networking with people that you want to connect with or that you feel like you could get some value from. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. And if anyone stays around, um, I can I can tell you about that. And talk about that a little bit. And if you're interested in that topic, mention it in the comments and I'll see if I can, I'll, you know, I'll kind of pontificate a little bit more around that in terms of ideas that I have for how you can connect appropriately with people who you want to be your mentors or people who, you know, you think could be some value to you through your business or, you know, people, to be honest, that you want something from. You have to give value before you can get value. And there's um, a process to that I can talk about. Um, 
so sorry, Dana, just to finish your thing. And then after you start networking with people, you got to get your design work out there. You have to get your design work out so people can see it and start being, you know, forward about, you know, maybe emailing some of your connections and saying, Hey, I just started a, a, a design um, agency. I'm doing X kind of work. Here's a link to, you know, some of the stuff I've done, or you start, like I said, in, in showing value to people, sending them some content, some interesting stuff that th they could be of use, use to them you, because you have to give before you ask. Um, and that is all what networking is all about. And to be honest with you, that's exactly what I'm doing here. That's what I've been doing here for two and a half or three years. I have been giving, 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 and I haven't asked anything of my community yet. And it's getting to the point where I am, where I'm actually going to start um, offering up some video courses and a membership community and uh, some paid mastermind groups and things like that. But I've been building my community for a long period of time, giving, 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 and that has developed an audience. And I have, an, I have a video coming out in just a week or so. It actually might be just Monday. This Monday's video is going to be on how to build an audience. And you should definitely uh, check that video out. And it's got two camera angles. Um, okay. So I'll get back to questions. Um, can you tell us, Jagoda, you, can you tell us about the most challenging branding design job you've ever had? Yeah, I can't name names. I would love to. <laughs> I would love to name names. And actually, Kathy Onetto, who is on this call right now, who I told you is amazing, you should check out her her uh, blog. Can you tell I used to work for Pepsi? It is the best diet cola, by the way. Um, and I can start a whole flame war about what's the best diet cola. Um, anyway, the most, the most problematic design project I ever had was with a very large grocer in the United States. They were developing a natural food brand. We were going to do, uh, we were going to name it, do the brand identity, do the packaging, the whole shebang. And at the very last moment, as we were about to start the identity, um, project, the head of uh, marketing and the, 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 the product development group in the comp in the client company decided to crowdsource the identity and they put it up on like 99 designs and they just got this deluge of like 800 different designs and they had a really hard time kind of uh deciding what design to work on and they narrowed it down to like 60 and then they they didn't know what to do and so they came back to us, their agency, who they'd contracted to do the identity. And they said, can you help us like figure out these 80 designs that we got and, you know, help us weed them down. And so we ended up having to go in and help them out on a bunch of crowdsource stuff, which was really bad. And then it ended up that we ended up doing the design anyway, but we'd burned through eight weeks of our, of our timeline. And it was just, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. So anyway, don't ask me questions like that because I will air dirty laundry. <laughs> but again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name any names. Um, fly ride. Yo, dude. Um, Sal, SoCal. Good to see you. Um, I just saw a bunch of your stuff on Instagram. Um, the, the guy on the screen right now, whose tag is fly ride does some of the most amazing custom lighting for, um, for cars in Southern California. Um, and that's the name of his company fly ride. So if you have a, a bitch in car and you want some like crazy innovative custom lighting on it. He's the man. Um, okay. Um, let me see question. You're designing a logo. Let me do this. Let me add this to the broadcast. Let me scale it up. Can I do that? It's not doing it, man. How the hell? There we go. Okay. Here we go. Uh, when you're designing a logo for an organization, would you base on who they are or would you base on who they want to become? Very good point. Um, very good questions. Um, if you design on who they want to be, you design for who they want to be when they grow up. Um, but here's the thing. Who you're really designing for is not them. Who you're really designing for is their customer. And this is a lot of things that companies forget is that they have a company aesthetic or they have an idea of what they want their product to be. And they're not taking into consideration, number one, the competitive landscape, what other people are doing for that product, that space, and who they are going up against 
and how those companies are doing it. And the other part of it is they don't think about the fact of who they're selling it to. And the, 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 the customer avatar that is going to be buying that product has a set of expectations, has a set of aesthetics, a set of needs around what they want out of a product or a company like that. And you have to think about that as you're desi designing. So yes, there's a level of aspiration in there. Absolutely. You don't want to just design for who people are. You want to design for where they want to be, but you also have to really take bank and make sure that you're making it consumer centric design work and you have to sell it in that way and you have to show examples of why you're doing it. Um, so hope that answers your question. Um, hmm. Um, my Fong. Let's do that. I have to scale these up every time. That kind of sucks. Um, how do you get inspired to create? How do you avoid having ideas that somehow already exist without knowing it? You can't. You know, I say this all the time. Everything has been done. Um, it's just a question of the new spin on it. Um, it is the rare, rare um, uh, thing that when someone does something that is completely innovative in terms of never been seen before. You know, David Carson, when he did Raygun Magazine, it was like the kind of crazy punk destructive thing that he did to, to print design was something that very few people had done before. You could say that people did it in Dada or people did it in, you know, futurism um, early, early in the century. But yeah, he was groundbreaking. Or is that, you know, how do you get inspired? I, I look for inspiration in things that are that outside of the category of what I'm working in. If I'm working in design or I'm working in design for an airline company, I may look at, you know, extreme sports for snowboarding. I may look at, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, custom car lighting, <laughs> you know, um, because you can get ideas for, from sources that are outside of the category that you're working on and translate them and move them into the category that you're working on. So that's how I, um, that's how I deal with inspiration a lot of times. I'm going to take my name slate off here because questions are popping up at the bottom of the screen and they're like layering on top of each other. Um, so I'm going to do that and then maybe I'll be able to see questions pop on the screen or maybe you guys tell me whether you can see, can you see questions popping up on your screen as they pop up? Um, I can, um, and I'm adding them to, to the screen as I am answering them. But, um, I, I'm just curious about that. As I said, you know, it's like, it's like I was talking about earlier, dare to suck, just start, figure it out. You know, I'm doing better than I did last time in the last live I did, but it certainly is not perfect. And, um, and that's what it's about. Constant learning. You can't be afraid. You got to put yourself out there. Um, okay, here we go. I'm just going to add this one before I even read it. Sorry. Um, hey, Philip, I'm currently a new designer and advertising agency here in Malaysia. What can I do to quickly improve my art direction, whether in form of reading or practicing or, oh, form of reading or practicing or et cetera? Um, in the best thing, and this is, I'm going to kind of tag this on to what I just said in terms of uh, designing for your target. The best thing that you can do in terms of art direction if you want to sell your work through and get it sold into the client on the shelf or, you know, on the shelf or in online or whatever the product is, right. That you're selling in, it could be UX design, whatever that is. Advertising could be a TV ad. Um, if you want to sell it in, um, okay. I, Kathy, I'm going to get your ears. Um, if you want to sell it in, you have to talk, um, in terms of the customer the end customer and what the, how the design is going to work for them because who you're selling it to is you're selling it to your internal account people who are the, the client interface for the most part in advertising agencies. And then you're selling it into the CMO of the company. Who's the end buyer of the, of the, um, the advertisement. So you need to learn how to speak about work and art direct work in terms of, customer focus, customer avatar focused, what they're looking for, what they want, what they need, and talk about it aesthetically in terms of what those people expect, what they need, and what is innovation to them or how they could get excited about something. And if you frame it in terms of the customer, it'll teach your designers, number one, 
because you're a creative director, you're a leader, you are teaching designers in every interaction that you have with them. It'll teach you to help, it'll teach them to help them think about what they do in a much more um, business marketing-like fashion. And it will also help sell in the work to the customer in a, in a better way. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, answer Kathy's question. Um, this was an early question someone asked. I know things are scrolling in, so I, I'm sorry I miss them. How do you combine professionalism with customer satisfaction? I'm not sure I totally understand that question. Combine professionalism with customer satisfaction. Kathy, you're gonna have to help me out on that one. I'm not sure I totally get it. Um, how do you combine professional? I'm sorry I'm being so obtuse. Um, but I'm going to knock that out. And I'm going to look for Kathy to explain that to me. Um, null Zero. Hey, welcome back. And I haven't been saying hello to people. Diego, Wizard of Crowds, Null Zero. Null Zero, I, re I, I remember your name. You show up in the comments. I really appreciate that. John, Rich, good to see you. Thank you guys for coming and spending a little bit of your Saturday with me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so, no. Posting your question. Uh, what role does data play in your designer branding? Um, you know, well, consumer insights are all based on data. There's two kinds of consumer insights. One is qualitative, which is feelings, emotional, you know, kind of internalized um, uh, uh, motivations. And the other is metrics. So, you know, how many people are choosing, how many things, you know, really kind of specifically numbers driven um, uh, feedback on research on things. And so when you're doing design um, in an agency setting anyway, for larger clients, a lot of times you will do design and then you'll go to focus groups and you will get customer feedback or consumer feedback on the work that you've done. That's qualitative, like in focus groups, or you can put, you know, surveys and a range of designs out online and um, people have to click and choose things and then you count, right? So how many people chose this design? How many people chose that design? Those are some of the things that data in terms of metrics play into design in my career anyway. The other thing I would say is that, you know, whenever you're looking at a competitive set in an in a, um, in a industry that you're working for, how successful the competition is, how much of the market they have captured, how, what is their sales volume, how many products do they have, how are they doing on those products, you know, who is killing it, who is not killing it financially. And in terms of um, market penetration, those are the sorts of things that really feed into my decisions around design and branding. So hope that answers your question. Um, I know I'm answering these on a very high level. You know, any one of these questions, this is the thing, any one of these questions could turn into like, you know, easily a half hour conversation and I can't do that. I really want to kind of entertain as, as many of these as I can. Okay. Um, Kathy is, is uh, kind of illuminating um, what that question was about. Um, this was someone else's question. I think it might be about how, how, uh, how do you remain professional when dealing with a different client and keeping them happy? Yeah, I know. And Kathy, <laughs> you, you know this. Um, anyway, how do you keep, um, how do you remain professional? Wow. Um, Boy, I mean, you just have to realize what's on the line. You know, I think that even, you know, I'm just going to bring it down to like even the comments I get on my YouTube videos. There's the rare person who's just goes out of their way in their day to make, try to make me feel like crap. Right. And there are clients who are just problematic, who are just sad sacks, who are just negative on everything, or they just have something in their life or in their business life that is just causing them a lot of pain and it's rolling downhill onto you. Um, and so the way I approach that is you always just have to take the high road. You have to always 
go into every situation with as much of a positive attitude as you can and as much of a solution-based approach as you can. And, you know, part of it is also recognizing that the client is a problematic client and making sure that you don't amplify that personification of them within your or own organization, right? You don't want to spread the fact that this is a problem client and they're a pain in the butt and all that sort of stuff or within the client's organization either. You just want to take a really positive turn on it and be solutions oriented, whether that's trying to figure out what the unlock is for the thing that's going to make them happy and try to address that as much as you possibly can, or at least verbalize it as much as you can with that client or frame the solutions you're bringing to the table around that, whether it's a stretch or whether that's actually real. I think that those are the sorts of things that um, really help in dealing with problematic clients. But in terms of professionalism, I think that you also, you just have to approach your entire role, your entire job, your entire interaction with clients in a super professional way. Because if you don't, it'll come back to bite you. I guarantee you. I hope that, if, Kathy, thank you so much for um, clarifying that comment for me. Um, I'm seeing some caps, but they're not questions. Like Shane, I don't know if that's a question. Um, yeah, you're making, I think maybe you guys are talking to each other. But if it says question in caps beforehand, um, I will recognize that it's a question. And Justin asks, how's everyone doing this weekend? That's an awesome question. And me, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day. And um, all you guys are here and you're spending a little bit of your Saturday morning with me. And I think that that's absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and so let's see, question. Um, Noah asks, what qualifications are required for jobs in design? Um, jobs in design is a pretty broad uh, question. Um, qualifications are, you know, a lot of companies, agencies require some sort of a degree. So it might be a degree in communications, might be a degree in design. Definitely, you know, high school, if not a, um, a bachelor's degree. Having a bachelor's in design or in communications or in marketing is not an absolute in terms of being able to break into the industry. Um, I have my master's in painting. I have a master's in fine arts. And I came to design through a back door, through the apparel industry, through being a creative director in the apparel industry and then into a large apparel company and then learned marketing and management and all that stuff that way. Um, that was kind of pre-internet. I also, you know, came on the internet wave as I did that. So is a degree absolutely necessary? Um, no, but I would say that, you know, I was talking to someone, someone in the comment section recently even said that, um, you know, I suggested that they possibly uh, try a temp agency. One of the things I recommend for people right out of school is that it's, you can either go work for client side or agency side. And I talked about this in my last live or, um, right out of school, sometimes a good idea is to go work for a temp agency like uh, Creative Circle or 24-7 or one of those big um, creative agencies that um, provide freelancers to companies and agencies. That way you can get farmed out. They do the legwork of finding client, clients, number one, because you're probably not very good at it right out of school. And number two, you can get a lot of different experience and a lot of different companies and agencies and get an idea of the creative professional landscape before you, you know, get married to your first company where you're going to have to stay for a couple of years. Um, so that's another way to doing it. And one of the people that I was talking to said that they didn't have a bachelor's in design and this company, this temp agency company didn't want to, um, farm them out because they didn't have that degree. So I think that degrees still, still matter, but if they're not absolutely critical, if you have a great portfolio and you know a lot, um, but a lot of times you got to get through the algorithm first and the algorithm reads your schooling. Um, okay. Valerie, um, Valerian, Paolo, good to see you. Um, um, Hamza, Jagoda, another question. Okay, you're staying up late, Jagoda. I know, I know it's late where you are. Hold on a second. Okay, um, Valerie Hansen asks, 
I just graduated from design school. I have a job, but I, uh, but I also want to take clients on the side. What process do you recommend when you begin a business with a new client? Um, what process do you, your own personal client? Um, the first thing that I do with any new client, number one, you have to have that introductory phone call where you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, what your specializations are. You know, you may talk about the project that the client has. This is if you've actually made contact with that client, what they're looking for, what, you know, and the questions I ask a lot of time is what, what are the results they're looking for? A lot of times people come, clients come and they say, I need a new website. And then you dig into it and you say, what do you really, you know, what are the results that you need? And um, sometimes the thing that they think they want, a new brand identity, a new website or more social media likes or whatever that is, isn't actually going to get them to their end result. So what I do first with clients is an in-depth discovery interview where I have, and I'm actually thinking about posting this as a, like a, a lead magnet or um, a downloadable PDF is my list of kind of onboarding discovery questions for clients, or at least a high level list of those things. The kind of things that you ask clients about their business, you know, basic things from, you know, who are they? What's the product line? Where are they where do they sell it? Where's their brand ecosystem? Where do they show up in the marketplace? You know, what's their revenue? Um, what's the size of the company? How is it organized? You know, who are their uh, who are their competitors? Uh, who do they want to be when they grow up? Like, who are they chasing? Who do they think is doing a great job in their industry? Who do they think is doing a bad job in their industry? Why? You know, a lot of times those kind of questions can be very revealing in terms of what their aesthetic is, whether they even know their competitive set. This is one of the things that blows me away. I just thought I'd mention this here too. And it's a little bit of a bugaboo that I have, which is that it blows me away how many clients I talk to who don't even understand the landscape of their industry. Um, and I mean, it's a good thing in one way because I get hired to do competitive audits a lot where I actually do a review of the of their industry and report back to them where their industry is, where they fall in it, and where there are opportunities to grow or to gain business. But that's the first thing I do. I do an in-depth interview with them to learn about their business and to try to uncover what I think is going to be the unlock to get them to the business result that they want. And then I sell in the services um, that are gonna get them there. Um, okay. Logan, um, sorry, Jagoda, I'm gonna get to your question first. Uh, Logan, I'll get back to you, hold on a second. Um, can, in my opinion, can clients, businesses distinguish good design portfolio for a, for a bad one? Um, yeah, I think they can. Um, I mean, there are some clients that are very, uh, you know, there are some clients that are very just purely aesthetic driven and there are others that, I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, it depends on the client. Some clients are very astute. Other clients just just don't get it or they have they have they kind of have shiny object syndrome um which i find a lot is that you know they may hook on to one thing they're seeing in the marketplace or something that apple did you know and they go we want to be the apple of car parts you know and you're like you kind of have to bring them down to earth and kind of get more real about it um and they might see something in your portfolio and go oh i love that aesthetic that you did for that website you know can we do it on our brochure, you know, um, those sorts of things are, are tough. I feel like I'm meandering a little bit. I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to take another question. Logan, I'm going to ask you a question. Sorry, Jagoda, that wasn't the best answer in the world. I'm out myself. Not the best answer. Um, Jagoda or sorry, Logan. Um, Logan asks, In your experience, are intellectual property laws enough to protect your creative work for anyone who would copy or use it without your permission? No, they're not. And the other thing is that with the internet, your stuff can be stolen and put anywhere, anytime. You know, I've, I've known people whose their designs have shown up on clip art sites. I've known people who um, have seen their design work come out on Fiverr for somebody else. 
you can all you can do is copy, uh, copyright your work. If you're working for a client, it's their responsibility, their attorneys, to make sure that they're pursuing and protecting their intellectual property. Um, but what I say to do is don't focus on that. Focus on the next thing. Focus on how, how to stay ahead. And the, the example I'll give for that is that in the, I was in the apparel industry for 15 years, and I was doing graphic design and apparel and, on apparel and packaging and stuff like that. And all of the fashion companies copy each other all the time. And, you know, we would copy people. People would copy us. It was like this very incestuous kind of trend, you know, kind of feeding frenzy constantly. And everyone was trying to keep up with the Joneses and outflank each other. And the thing is, is that you can't focus on what your competitors are doing. You have to focus on what's or what they're stealing from you. You have to and get bent out of shape about that. You just have to do the next thing. And so they are always trying to catch up. And so I say the th same thing about design, the same thing about um, intellectual property is that you just have to keep producing and let the people who are going to steal, steal because there's no way you can stop them. I mean, one of the things I see and is that I have my YouTube videos, people take them and put them up on other websites in, you know, China and Asia and, you know, the Ukraine and stuff like that. And I, and they're, and they're kind of like aggregation sites. They do it with tons and tons of people. They'll like, you know, pull, I don't, it might even be a bot that does it and pulls the videos and puts them on their site. And I'll get a Google alert that my videos are showing up on another site. And you go on the site and there's like no way to contact them apart from the URL. There's no who is database on there. There's almost nothing you can do about it, but it's also so small and their reach is so small that it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt my business. So Logan, don't worry about it. Move forward. Um, Theo, good question. Okay. Can you put your branding process into key stages? Um, or do you have a specific process? Yes, you should put your branding process into key stages. And yes, I do have a process. Um, I don't share that. Um, freely. My process is my process. My process has also been informed greatly by the companies and agencies that I've worked for. I've seen a lot of different processes, what works and what doesn't work. And I have adopted what I think works or doesn't work. And the other thing is that I'm not, my clients generally are not the fortune 100 like they used to be. They are hundred million dollar and less size companies or, or entrepreneurs. And so the processes that I use with them are slightly different than the processes I used before. But what I would say is map out what you think your process steps are um, and try to follow them. Or at least when you're pitching into clients, you can describe what your process generally is. And to tell you the truth, I also change my process depending on the client I'm working on or the scope of the project that I'm working on. I may change or augment or drop aspects or expand or contract parts of my process depending on their particular needs. So processes are great, but you don't want to be a slave to them. The other thing I would say is that just about every single freaking design agency on the planet, you go on their website and it's like, here's our, you know, trademarked, um, you know, completely proprietary, like special behind the curtain, like wizard of Oz process. That is so bull. So many companies have a essentially the same process but they have rebranded it or renamed it something to make it flashy. And so they can sell it. They're marketing people. They're selling it. You know, what are processes? You do a discovery. You figure out what your client's needs are. You do some competitive uh, work, find out who the co competition is, find out who the customer is. You design into what their need is. And then you, you know, and then you sell it into the client and you make sure that it performs in the marketplace. Those are the major steps in the process. Yes, there are a lot of different things within there. There's naming, there's strategy, there's, you know, all that sort of stuff, but those are the big buckets. Um, that's that. Okay. All right, let's see. It's hard to read and keep talking all at the same time, so you got to give me a second to read here. Um, Andrea says... Question, a market research investigation is a huge project itself. Yes, it is. When the client does not have enough information about the market, I have to do this? Yes. 
You do. And whether they will pay you to do it or whether you just do it in a, in a small way yourself, you have to do it because when you're selling in your work to the client, you have to base it in something other than just aesthetics. Cause if you're selling in your work just based on aesthetics, it's a beauty contest and then no one wins, right? They like purple, you like orange, that's aesthetics. But if you come in and you say, I'm presenting orange because your customer, your, your customer target loves orange and I can prove it that will sell in the work. Otherwise it's just a beauty contest. So you can, you know, I do market research. Kathy Onetto does market research. I don't know if she's still here. Um, and, or competitive analysis, competitive research. You can sell that in as a service to your clients and provide them with that information. Or you can do it just as part of your process in a small way to inform your design process. Um, but you're right. It is a huge project in itself. And it is a huge industry just on its own. Um, okay. Jody, you're asking all the questions, just getting me all fired up. What do I, here, what? I hate this scrolling thing, man. This scaling thing. Um, what do you think of Fiverr? Oh, you're just trying to get me fired up, aren't you? Um, I'm not a big fan of Fiverr. You know, I mean, I think that the whole concept of, you know, getting something for five bucks where you, you know, can get some work, you can start to develop a relationship and hopefully you can upsell people to larger, larger projects, crowdsourcing or anything that looks like work, spec work, or that is you are doing design work and hoping to get the project. And if you don't, then you've done all this work for nothing. I think that's for people who are either just starting out. Oh, hey, Kathy, good. That's cool. I'm glad you're still here. Um, that's for people who are just starting out. Um, and, you know, people in developing countries. And I, it, because they can feed their family on $30 a month. And we can't do that here. And so I think I think Fiverr and 99designs and, you know, those cloud service, crowd service design companies are degrading the industry, but it's also a subsegment of the industry. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about fiber because fiber exists and 99 designs exist and all the cloud, you know, um, crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing design services exist. They are commoditizing the design, um, world and the globalization of the economy has also commoditized design. So that's why I am always pushing in every single video I do, every single interaction I have with a designer, creative professional, or entrepreneurs even, is you have to up your skill set. You have to take it to the next level. You can't just design anymore. You have to bring a level of, and this is for you, Andrea, too. You have to bring a level of added value to your design. So whether that is your ability to do customer research or, um, or your ability to do competitive research or audit or visualization, or your ability to do copywriting or your ability to do motion or your ability to do, um, uh, you know, social media marketing, um, adding a level of ability above just design is the thing that's going to help you survive. And it really comes down to survival, really, at this point. If you're just doing logo design, God help you, really. I mean, you're going to have to up your game in order to be competitive in the marketplace. Because almost anything digital is has been commoditized. I mean, look at the music industry. I mean, m professional musicians can only make money on merch and touring now. Like, no one makes money from, from selling music on iTunes or something like that. Everything's free. Everything's free on, you know... Pandora or Spotify. Um, so anyway, here end of that rant is that, you know, you have to, you really have to up your skill level and offer a broader, more, you know, thinking level of offering to take yourself out of the commodity space. Um, Shane asks, um, What's the best process for a rebrand? Treat it like anything else, creative ideation, back and forth with clients and revisions. Yeah, rebrand is just branding. I mean, you're just redoing it. 
So, I mean, you're, you just have to look at what ex the complexity and rebranding is that you are dealing with a brand that already exists and a certain amount of brand equity that also exists exists in the marketplace in terms of recognition, people remembering you or people revering the brand. Whenever you do a rebrand, you are sacrificing brand equity because you're changing it. And so is the process of rebranding different? Yes, it is different because you have to take into consideration what exists in the brand right now and what kind of equity that has and what you're willing, what you are or what they are willing to sacrifice in changing it. And you have to be really have a really high level of communication and understanding of what that brand equity is when you rebrand. Because if you do, it's a, it's a, it's a danger inflection point, right? Anytime you change something, you know, look at retail. If you change a package on a shelf, everyone who looks for your package, if you suddenly change the colors or the logo, and they can't see it in like 12 seconds walking down the aisle, you've lost half of your existing customers and you have to get them back. So that's that's my thing about rebranding. Same process, you just have to take the current brand equity into consideration. Um, uh, Valerie, I wish I knew how to pronounce your name. Valerian, Valer, Valerian, um, how do you go about getting data for um, creating design personas to test with. Um, you can buy it for one thing. There are, there are data services for industries, but generally that's, it can be pretty expensive and, and, and large agencies are the ones who usually um, use that. Um, there is a lot of data online that you can purchase to insights around particular industries. Um, you can also do your own research around what's happening in the industry in terms of trend and news and um, sales, um, how well the company is doing, what the revenue is, all that sort of stuff. Um, so you can do your own research or you can buy research and there are, you know, high level research companies that provide customer data. Um, and there are, you know, ones online that are cheaper that you can buy reports on data. So things, you know, companies like Stylus, right. Um, a trend service company, um, they will do customized reports on particular industries for you and sell them to you. Um, and then you just, you know, depending on how big the project is, you can, you know, sell that, I mean, as an expense through your, through to your client. Um, because a lot of times clients don't even know that stuff exists and they can really value it. If it's a great report, you know, you could get the report, you can mark it up and make it part of your deliverable. Um, thanks for the super chat, Jagoda. Really appreciate that. Um, Super Chat is another thing that if you guys want to support me, I mean, it's only a dollar here and there, but if you want to support me through a Super Chat, that would be awesome. Um, it's just like a tip. Um, and uh, it, it will pin your comment to the comment section for a period of time, depending on the amount. Um, Kathy asks, I'm going to, I'm going to support Kathy again for her question. Um, Kathy, it cracks me up that you're asking me questions in this forum. Um, what have you found to be the best support systems for you as an entrepreneur? Wow. Okay. That's a really cool question. The best support systems. When I was first starting off leaving corporate and agency life, the best support system for me was the network of people that I knew from my corporate and agency life, one of whom was Kathy Onetto. And she, you know... And that's why I'm always harping on the fact that you got to make friends and stay in touch with the people that you like and respect from previous jobs or agencies that you've had. Because once you either change what you're doing or go out on your own, those are the people that are going to be really meaningful for you to work with as partners or to act as referrers for you. Um, and so that's, you know, your network, your close network is a really key, important um, support system when you're starting to be an entrepreneur or freelance, go out on your own. The other is for me, um, I joined a paid mastermind community, one of the larger ones. Um, and 
that jump started my understanding of the entrepreneurial space in terms of content marketing, email marketing, uh, list building, all that sort of stuff, which I had not gotten deeply involved in when I was in my corporate and agency career. And so that was a huge um, rocket fuel adding aspect when I got involved into a paid mastermind. And I'm going to be starting a paid mastermind soon. And so building a network of people who, you know, you can learn from and also surrounding yourself with other people who are trying to learn the same stuff and also know stuff builds your network of people that you know, but also you can bring skill sets and things that you can offer to that group. And then you can gain information from those people as well. So masterminds, huge paid organized ones or informal ones. I still participate in that paid mastermind, but I also um, have a uh, mastermind community that I do a, a Zoom call with every Friday. There's eight entrepreneurs who are at my level or higher. And we, um, we have a mastermind and share best practices and feedback and motivation with each other. That is another great uh, support system and motivator and learning forum um, as an entrepreneur. Um, so I hope that helps, Kathy. Um, Shane, you're welcome. Um, you're welcome. I'm glad you answered. Uh, Preeti, good to see you again. I remember you from the last live. Thanks for thanks for coming back. I really appreciate that. Um, you want to learn? Okay, wait. Here we go. I want to learn brand strategy. Which courses would you recommend I should look into? Um, there are courses. I'm going to have one soon. So wait, and then I'll do mine. Um, no, but there are, if you want to go the big uh, university level, um, Coursera is an amazing um, uh, platform for university level, like high level university. And it is, you know, the cost of it is commensurate with the level of university education you're getting from it. Um, but there are brand strategy and marketing um, courses there. There are, you know, lower level brand strategy um, kind of video courses on lynda.com, on uh, Skillshare, um, those sorts of platforms. And there's also obviously books about it. So if, you know, it, depending on cost or how you best take in information, how you best, uh, you know, absorb um, education materials, uh, you could read about it. Um, it I will, I'll, I'll give that some more thought and pull, pull together some resources, either a book list or um, some courses. And um, that's a very good point. Maybe I'll do a video on that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, the, you're welcome, Kathy. Appreciate that. Um, Null Zero asks, um, what billing structure have you found works best for you and your clients? That is a really good question. And I just read some horror story recently somewhere. I, it was in some forum. I can't remember where it was, but some guy who like did like a crazy inordinate amount of work on a $15,000 project. The client like drug him through the mud on it forever. And he got stiffed for the whole thing. <laughs> and he's going to have to take him to court. Nightmare scenario. Pricing structure that I, if you're saying pri billing, sorry, billing structure, billing structure is that I take 50% up front and 50% um, up front. If the project is over 20 or $25,000, I'll take 25% three quarters of the way through and then 25% at the end, depending on the size of the project. You can also bill per phase depending on the complexity of the project or how long it's going to take. Like if you're on a long project, it's nine months long or something, and there's 10 different phases in it, you may want to bill per phase because things happen. CMOs leave, product managers leave, the whole thing could get blown up. If you're three quarters of the way down the line and you've only gotten paid your 50% and the whole project goes away, you don't want to be left having to eat that 25%. So I, I take 50% and 50% at the end. And I generally get paid before I deliver the final files. They'll get the final presentation. They know what they're going to get. But in, when I deliver the final artwork, digital files, get the, get the final 50%. So that's the billing structure that I use. Um, 
And I do not invest much time or energy until I get that 50% because, you know, you can, they can put pressure on you. We got to get going. We got this deadline, you know, we're rolling it, moving on this and yeah, we'll get to, you know, the checks going through, you know, whatever the billing department, I'm really upfront at the very beginning, which is like, as soon as I receive the 50% deposit, that's when the timeline and the proposal starts. So that behooves them to get the, the money and the check cut quickly because it's in their court. You got to put it in their court. Um, people will, you know, the thing about service industries is that people will get you to jump through hoops, particularly agencies. Companies are really great at trying to at getting their company, their comp, their agencies to jump through hoops. And, you know, if you do, someday, someday your pants are going to get caught on the hoop <laughs> and, and you get caught with your pants down. And if you haven't been paid for it, um, you're, you're, you have yourself to blame. So that's my billing structure. Um, okay. What do we got? Um, if I saw, can you answer my question? Sad face. Okay. If I saw, I'm going to, I'm going to scroll back and see if I can find your question and it's way back there. Where we go. Okay. Um, there you go. Sorry about that. A lot coming in, Faisal, so I'm, I, I, can't, I can't keep up with everything. Um, I have given gave an idea that saves more than $100 million. I did not get anything because I'm an employee in this company. Now I have a great idea. It can change the way we use things. How? Protect it. Okay, so it sounds like you're working in a really big company. You came up with an idea that saved the company a hundred million dollars. And now you have another great idea that could make them a whole lot of money. How do you protect it? Um, that is, if you are working for that company, every idea and activity and input that you have, that you're giving to that company, they own it because they're paying you a salary. And that's why they're paying you a salary. If you have a groundbreaking, innovative idea for them that you are willing to quit your job with them and confident about it, to not be employed with them when you pitch your idea, you get, you know, get them to sign. You don't work for that company anymore and you try to get someone to pitch it to and you go in with an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, a legally binding document that says that you're gonna show them some intellectual property and they can't do anything with it unless they buy it and they can't tell anybody about it, et cetera, et cetera, then you can pitch it to them. And then they have they have the choice whether to buy it or not. I knew somebody when I was working with um, at Gap Inc., I knew somebody who had an idea that saved Gap Inc. like $150 million in FedEx overnight fees. And he told Mickey Drexler, the CEO, about it in passing in the hallway. And he said, I have this idea. Did he get some crazy bonus? Did he get, a, you know, like 50% of the $150 million he saved? No, he didn't. Mickey Drexler mentioned his name at a, at a couple big meetings. And so he got props for it. But he worked for the company. He came up with an idea. He gave it to the company. The company benefited. That's how it works. Um, if you don't work for the company and you feel strongly enough about it, protect your idea with an NDA before you tell anybody and then try to sell it into the company or sell it into one of the competitors. I hope that answers your question. All right. I'm going to scroll back to the beginning again or in the end. Sorry. Um, okay. Pretty. I, I hope you do. I hope you do um, pay attention or, or, um, excuse me, um, show up. And um, that's another reason why, and I'm going to put this up here, you guys. Um, my email list. If anyone is here and is not on my email list, this is the URL to join it. I do a mail, I do a newsletter every two weeks. It's called Brand Views, and I share an insight and some resources and a particular article and a book and quotes and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, that's where I announce my YouTube lives. And it's also um, where I'm going to start um, sharing 
uh, the new products that I'm going to be developing in terms of a mastermind group, um, video courses, book. That's where you get the news from me. Um, you only get a portion of it through my videos. Um, or if you happen to come across this in your feed and, and get to show up on time. Um, so if you haven't signed up for my email list, I would say definitely do that. I'm going to take this off of there right now. Um, put that, yeah. Um, okay. All right. What do we got? Helen. Hey, good to see you back. Thank you for coming back. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Douglas. Hey, Douglas. Welcome. Um, Kavino. Welcome. Um, Douglas asks, will a copy of this video be available on your channel later? Yes. Um, and all YouTube live videos, when you're done with them, they get automatically posted. Um, so all of my YouTube lives will be, um, available. The thing that's not about it, you know, if you don't show up when it's live, you don't get to, you know, ask a question. So Douglas, do you have a question? Ask a question, man. Um, and, um, but, and that's the cool thing is that, you know, I'm, I'm giving you some of my Saturday and you're giving me some of your Saturday and we're, you know, getting to interact and, and have a conversation. This is something I also wanted to mention. And this started to happen in the last live that I did is that the people who were attending also started to have conversations with each other. Like some person was having a legal problem and put a question out to me. I gave some feedback on it, but then someone who had experience in that a little deeper than I did started to, to interact with that person in the comments section directly. And I thought that was awesome. I mean, that's the kind of community that I love fostering. And, you know, it's you guys as a community helping you each other out. And that's exactly to Kathy's question earlier, which is what happens when you start working in masterminds is it's not the lead, the leader of the mastermind and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the abilities and the smarts and the capabilities that person is bringing to the mastermind is only part of it. The people that that person is attracting and the things that those people are trying to work on and better themselves in and improve on, it's the community that is where the real value is. And so the mastermind leader is the magnet it's bringing those people together around a particular topic or theme or, um, or goal for themselves. But it's the community and their ability to interact with each other and learn from each other. Um, which is where the power is. And the mastermind the group that I'm in on Friday with eight other people on a Zoom, that actually started the first few people I met in this paid mastermind community that I'm part of. And we broke out and we did our own thing. And since I've been kind of bringing in other people that I know, other entrepreneurs that I know to participate in that mastermind, and it's been growing and getting even stronger. But that's where the real value lies. Um, Okay, Katz, you had another question. Um, uh, do you go about branding an organization or association differently than a company or a product? And are, are the steps the same? Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's different because, I mean, if you are branding a, a, a company or a product, organization association differently than a company. What I would say is an association or organization is like a company, but a product or an offering or a service is different because it is under a company. So products, yes, totally different, I think, because you are developing a brand around a product that is under the umbrella of a company or another brand. So how you go through the process for that is different. Um, how you go about branding an organization or an association isn't that different from how you are doing a company. The only thing that's going to differ greatly is whether it is, I mean, an association or organization could be nonprofit. It could be not based around, you know, market domination could be based around, you know, social good or something like that. And how you would go about branding them or your approach to it might not be market based. It might be, have a different, have a different, um, a strategic, uh, uh, goal. So how you would go about that process might be slightly different. Um, but like I said, the basic, here's the thing, the basic structure of branding for companies or products 
follow a specific range of steps. And that process, I've, I've done that process and Kathy, who's on the call, has done that process for Fortune 60 companies, huge, you know, 10, $20 billion a year companies. And I've done the exact same process for a $1 million a year company or a $500,000 a year entrepreneur. I've scaled it down, you do it slightly differently, but the, how you brand and the structure of establishing a brand identity and a marketing platform are the same. It's just a question of scale. Um, Patty, um, why did I decide to go out on my own? Um, I, I talked about this a little bit before and I have talked about it also in, in some of my videos. Um, I had a long 25 plus year career, both in cor corporations, fashion, uh, retail industry, as well as consumer packaged goods on the client side and a number of uh, global branding agencies leading everything from three person teams to 65 person teams. And I reached a point in my career um, where I had some personal family stuff going on and the alignment with the intensity of the job that I was in caused a lot of friction in my life emotionally. <laughs> and um, I, I burned out, to tell you the truth. I had a major burnout. Um, and I, it made me reevaluate. I started to question why I was doing what I was doing, and I wasn't really sure I was having that much fun with it anymore. And so I took some time off. And when I took time off, I realized that I need to approach it in a different way. And I had a different set of passions than I did when I was working on gigantic brands and gigantic products. And um, I started to explore some curiosities that I had um, around um, around uh, craft in America and entrepreneurship and e-commerce. And those led down a line to um, starting my own um, brand consultancy and doing things in the way that I wanted to do and to develop my own personal brand and my own personal entrepreneurial um, landscape. Um, so for me, it was, you know, I had a long, very successful career in the corporate and agency world. And then I met, I met an inflection point in my life where it just said to me, it was time to do something different. Um, and the, that's when I decided to go out on my own. Sorry, my nose, I'm scratching my nose a lot because I have allergies and the trees in New Jersey are like pollinating like freaking dust explosion bombs right now. And so I'm a little itchy. I apologize. Um, so, uh, Valerie asked another question. This is an interesting one too. What do you do when a potential client tells you it's too expensive? You say, thanks. Thanks. I, the work that I do um, and the value that it delivers for my clients, um, it, it demands this level of investment. When you are ready to invest in your brand to a point where it will get the results that you really need at the level that you need those results, we need, we can talk. But, you know, if it's too expensive, it's too expensive. You know, when you're really hungry and you have no work and you, you know, and you need to do something, sometimes you, you know, you may need to t make the choice to lower your prices to just keep the engine going. But what happens is, is that you'll do work for that price for that client and then they'll come back and they'll expect the same work or more work at the same level of price and you dug yourself into a hole or you'll have to fire them. But it, you know, it's, it's the toughest thing to say, you know, my work cost X and they'll say, oh, well, that's too much. And you'll say, you know, I'm sorry, that's what it costs. And, you know, maybe we're not the right um, agency for you or the right brand for you. I have a freelancer or I have a contact who might be better or more, might align more with your budget. Um, you can't. I mean, you can do the best you can to sell in your services, but when someone just doesn't have the money, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, 
Uh, Noah asks, oh boy, this is, this is a quick answer. What, uh, what experience in apparel design do you have? I didn't design apparel, but I designed graphics for apparel. So graphics, embroideries, um, CAD textile design, so pattern design. Um, T-shirt, I was the VP of um, graphic design for apparel for Old Navy for 11 years. Um, graphic T-shirt and graphic apparel at Old Navy was a $700 million a year business. And my 65 person, five division teams developed all of the product for that over 11 year period of time. I've shopped the globe for apparel trend and graphic trend. Um, and so if there's one thing I know about in the world, it's t-shirts. I mean, I, I know the t-shirt industry, um, apparel design, like, you know, the cut of garments and stuff like that. I don't know anything about that. Um, cause I'm not really of an apparel designer. Um, yeah, it's not off topic. No, I actually, someone said that they were going to ask me about that in one of the videos I had recently. Um, and I said, I was going to talk about it if they showed up and asked. So sorry, it needs more. Um, Cavino, Cavino Latino, um, asks, are you, are junior design roles rare to find? Um, I've been having trouble finding a junior role and believe I'm not qualified for mid-level role. No, I think actually junior level roles are the easiest to find because if you can, if you can design junior level roles are less expensive to people than mid-level roles. Um, so it's really a question of just finding, you know, um, finding a company you want to work for and, um, or a temp agency, um, and, uh, temp agencies might be harder for totally junior if you're just starting out. Um, but the, the best idea is to find companies that you want to work for and focus your attention around them. Um, Sorry, uh, I mean, I have to pick and choose here a little bit. Sorry. Um, Joe asks, and I answered this a little bit before, but would you recommend studying design at a college university? Is better to just get straight in the industry? Yes, I would say design. I didn't. So I'm, you know, not practice. I didn't practice what I preached, but I also didn't go about my career in a very linear way. Um, but I would say in terms of establishing a foundation and understanding what it is that you're doing and setting yourself up, because here's the thing, you can go into the industry and eventually not having a degree may come back to bite you. But if you at least have that foundation, then you can never point to that and say, the reason I'm not getting work in the industry is because I don't have a BA in design or a BFA in design or something like that. So I would say, yes, studying in design is still, is still an important thing to do. Um, but if you can't, afford a full on design school, take classes at community college, you know, um, there are ways of getting an education, um, that don't require a degree, but if you can get a degree, I would say yes to get one. Um, uh, no, ask what are your thoughts on, um, print on demand for apparel in 2019? Print on demand is like the coolest thing that ever happened. I'm sorry. It's like, I think it's absolutely amazing. Well, here's the thing. It's also totally commoditized the industry. And it's not like the t-shirt industry or the graphic design t-shirt industry was commoditized in the first place, but it has made everything so much easier. So like, if you want to get a hat that says, I love branding on it, you can get a hat made from a print on demand place in like two seconds. And that never used to happen. I mean, back in the day you used to get, they would have a 200 hat minimum or something like that. Um, print on demand is fantastic, especially for designers because you can develop all sorts of swag and, and have almost no investment in it. And that's incredible. And you can also offer that to your clients and you can make an impression with your clients using print on demand, you know, printing some cool swaggy giveaway thing and just sending it to your clients. So you, you know, stand above the rest of your competition. Those sorts of things make print on demand 
incredible um, as a resource for us, for designers. Um, okay, Jagoda, I know. Bedtime for you. I know it's super late where you are. Um, thank you so much for showing up. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure I'll see you back. Um, <laughs> okay, Helen. And I think, Helen, you're the one who was going to ask me about this, um, about the apparel thing. Thanks for answering everyone's questions. I'd love to hear about your research process when you were traveling world for graphic design and creating T-shirts. What kinds of things did you look for? Whenever you're looking for a trend, and uh, you know, I do trend videos for graphic design too. When you're looking for trend, and th this is what we did when we traveled around the world, we would travel to Berlin, Paris, Milan, Tokyo, Antwerp, and we would shop apparel stores and we would look for graphic designs or any kind of uh, graphics on on apparel and what you do is you look for anything that's um, technically innovative so a new printing technique a new you know placement technique um, a new process you know whether it's you know flocking or whether it's you know iridescent or something like that you look for innovation in terms of process you look for innovation in terms of design. So anything that maybe you hadn't seen that much. So you look for newness, but then you also, when you're looking for trends, you look for um, movements in design or volume of certain types of things that are gaining mass or starting to gain mass in the industry. And we would tend to shop very high-end stores and high-end stores weren't like for for ma for the mass market, they were for an elite market, and the designers who design for elite take more chances and are more cutting edge than mass. And the company I was working for, Old Navy, was more mass, so we were looking at much higher end. And so you look for themes that start to develop, and then you buy you know examples of those themes. And then you come back and you kind of arrange it all in a big room and you look at all of the innovative stuff that you bought and all of the themes that you see emerging and you decide how you can expand, change, or innovate on those themes or ideas. That was the process that we went on. And then we went off and, and designed. Um, yeah, Helen says, BA for print on demand. Absolutely, that is so true. Um. Yes, I know, Helen, you're the person that asked if you could talk. Oh, yeah, to talk to your group. Um, yeah, please, please do um, email me after. Um, I'd be happy to do that um, or happy to talk about it anyway. Um, so question, Brad says, printify versus printable. I'm not familiar with those. Um, so ask the group. Anyone? Brad asked a question. Um, yeah, Helen asked some really killer questions. And the other thing is Helen shows up in my comment section on my videos. And this is something I want to chat about, which is in any kind of branding, particularly personal branding and network building, it's about becoming recognized and being remembered. I always talk about the three R's branding is being recognized, remembered and revered. And when you're building a network, and this is the topic that I wanted to talk about when I started the, the, uh, the live, the opportunity gap. How do you make a connection with people? How do you make a connection to network with people? How do you make a connection to get a mentor? How do you make a connection to get a job? How do you make a connection to get a client? How do you initiate that level of relationship? How you do it is you start showing up. And Helen shows, started showing up in the comments on my videos and she started ask, making smart comments and asking smart questions. And we started a conversation. And so when she showed up in my live video, I knew who she was. That's brand recognition. And also she was offering value to me before she had an ask. And that is also really important because when you're reaching out to somebody, and I said this earlier on in the video, in the, in the live, I get a lot of emails where people tell me their whole life story about, you know, what happened to them since high school and where they are now and where their portfolio is and what their job, 
needs are and what their family situation is and all this sort of stuff. And then they say, please review my portfolio and call me and give me feedback. And it's like, number one, it's kind of rude because you are doing a huge, huge ask of me without developing any kind of relationship with me and expecting me to just because you saw a video of mine, like become your mentor service. And that is, you know, sorry, a little bit of a rant warning, but the way to develop a relationship with someone is not to do that. Number one, reach out to them in direct message or an email or a comment section and keep it short. I love what you're doing. You know, interesting point you made about X, you know, then you show up the next day and you say, I read this really cool article. It was about what you were talking about in that video. Here is a link to it. And then you show up the day after that and you say, oh, I found, you know, I, I, I thought I was thinking about this article I just sent you and I thought X, what did you think of it? Just start a relationship and you're showing up in a very non ASCII kind of way can start to build some recognition of who you are. And then over time, if you are giving value to them, you can eventually start with small asks and hope that they have, they can respond. They might not be able to, but that's how you develop um, kind of a back and forth in a conversation. And Helen did that and she's a great example of it. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about because I get a lot of questions about like, how do I build a network? How do I get new clients? You know, how do I meet other designers? How do I grow my skills? It all comes with, with reaching out and starting a conversation and being recognized by somebody else. And you only do that by showing up regularly, offering value in an non-confrontational way um, or a non-ASCII kind of way. And that's how you build a network. You do that with peers. You do it with clients. You do it with network connections. You do it with people who you want to be your mentor. Um, you need do it from people who you want feedback from. And that's how you start to build relationships. Um, you don't want to stalk. You don't want to be a pest. And if, if you know, you want to take no for an answer, if, you know, that's what happens. And you go in with no expectations. Here's the thing. Doing content marketing, you have to offer value with no expectations of return. And I would say that's also how you have to go about networking. You offer value or assistance or help with no expectation of return because that's what builds good relationship karma and that's what builds good relationships. Um, so there endeth the rant. So I'll, I'll, I'll way back into the comment section now. Um, Okay, here's one question from DJ MPTV. Um, how often have you needed to have a lawyer on call throughout your design career? Well, when I was working for agencies and 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 corporates, uh, corporate companies, we had lawyers on staff. So, like when I was in the fashion industry, I was meeting with lawyers all the time, um, and I was communicating with lawyers all the time because we had a lot of intellectual property, and we were also selling products that we were selling in the millions of. So everything we did had to go through legal review before it got produced, um, and so um, I've had a lot of interaction with lawyers. I've interacted with lawyers doing, um, you know, trademark work for clients. I've interacted with lawyers in um, doing name searches for naming that I've done, um, lawyers to write an NDA for me, lawyers to write, you know, client contracts for me, um, a lot, you know, um, some for clients, some for my own agency business. Um, so anyway, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Null says Unsplash is a great way to discover new creative assets. Yeah, Unsplash is great. Also like Envato, Market, E-N-V-A-T-O. Um, Market is a great resource. Graphic River is a great source. I think they're actually kind of related. Um, I'm working on a project for a client right now where I'm having to use a lot of stock photography for a website. And, um, you know, I bought like a, 
a big monthly license for iStock. And iStock also has a tremendous amount of vector-based graphics and icons and um, graphic resources that aren't isn't just stock photography. So iStock's another one, um, a great one. There's also tons and tons of free graphic resources um, online as well. And I actually just shared one in my newsletter that I just put out um, on Tuesday. So if you subscribe to my newsletter, you would get that sort of stuff. Um, so, um, Catherine, it's good to see you too. Thank you for coming back. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so any more questions? Oh, I'm, I, sorry. I didn't hadn't scrolled down. Um, Cape Town watercolor art. I literally just switched on YouTube notifications for seeing your live video. Well, that's cool. Thank you. And you all should. I mean, if if any of you, number one, who are in this and just saw me come up live and decided to show up, um, please subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications, that little bell icon. So if I go, I'm going live or if I put out a new video, you will get notified um, of that. Please do that. Um, and also go to, sorry, wait, right there. Email list, philipvandusen.com slash muse. And sign up for my newsletter it comes out every two weeks and I share um, an insight and some resources and articles and books and quotes and cool stuff on design, marketing and entrepreneurship. And if you're on that list, you are going to be the first to know um, whether I'm offering any kind of exclusive kind of content or live videos or um, I'm actually working on the idea of an event, physical event with some other key um famous and influential design um, people who I've got verbal commitments for probably in New York city um, where it will be, you know, probably a day or multi-day um, design um, event. Um, so put that in your thinking cap and join my mailing list. Cause when that happens, that's where you're going to learn about it. Um, Wizard of crowds. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Regarding MVP as per, uh, versus perfectionism, how do you decide this work is good enough as MVP to go? If you're asking yourself the question, it's good enough. That's what I say. Um, because MVP is all about getting feedback from your, from your audience and iterating and improving as you go along. So if you are starting to question yourself whether it's ready to post or ready to show, it's ready to show. That's my point on that. Because generally we wait too long. I do. Um, Laura, thank you for um, officiating <laughs> and in my comment section. I really, really appreciate it. And I have to figure out why that stupid thing went away. Why it went away. I had this great little graphic that said, you know, preface with a question. Um, maybe I'll create one right now. Can I do that? No, I can't. Wait. Here we go. I'm going to do it. Preface. Sorry. I know this is like, this is like your question in caps. So I can organize it in all caps. All right, there we go. See, MVP, done on the fly, right? That's what it's about. Um, did I spell everything right? Yes, I did. Now, Laura, you can sit back and relax, right? Um, okay. All right, cool. Uh, Richard. Welcome, Richard. Just watched one or two of your vids, just stumbled on this live stream. Great stuff. Uh, liked you pointing out engaging with people. Um, it's all about engaging with people. I love engaging with you people. I really do. This is like, I'm so stoked for this. I was so excited about it. When I did my first live a week ago, I got to tell you this. When I first did, I get excited doing content. I get excited interacting with people. Um, and when I did my last video, uh, the very first live video I did a week ago, I didn't announce it. It was totally MVP. I knew I was going to suck. I knew I had to figure out the interface of my software and all that sort of stuff. And I just hit live on Friday morning. 
and a ton of people showed up and it was awesome. And I, I thought I was going to be on for like 30 minutes. I was on for two hours. Like I'm heading into that territory now. Right. I'm like at an hour and a half. And, um, it was amazing. And when that two hours was over, I was like on this emotional high for like two hours. I was so jazzed about the interaction and the questions and the ability to engage with you guys directly. I'm just so stoked. It's it. This is awesome. You, anyone who subscribes to my channel knows that I answer every single uh, comment that I get. Some I can answer more in depth than others, but I answered every single of the 10,000, 20,000 comments I've received. Um, and I like that engagement because I value you guys. And I know that, you know, the off, the value I'm offering you is important to you. And so I love the back and forth. I mean, I think that this, this is a really fun format for me. And the other thing is that it gives you, you know, a much better idea of like who I am as a person, you know, I want to be a person. I mean, when you see me in my videos, it's a little more polished. I'm, you know, I'm trying to stay on point and put across a tremendous amount of information in a very short period of time. And my videos are, you know, a little more direct. Um, and so I've wanted to kind of create a much more kind of personal level of conversation, both in having you understand kind of like what kind of human being I am, um, how I actually talk in real life. And, um, because I think that there's real value in that. Like everybody wants to know, you know, I'm a personal brand and I'm growing my personal brand and everyone wants, you know, there's the Phil Van Dusen who's, you know, in my YouTube videos, which is the edited polished Phil Van Dusen. And then there's this guy who is like Mr. Off the Cuff. Um, and, uh, that's, I want, I want everyone to see all of it because that's what it's all about. And. The other thing is I would totally recommend it for you guys too, because you really have to um, show your everything, you know, you have to be human people. There was this expression of a guy who was executive creative director at Landor, who was a coworker of mine. Um, and he said, no one likes a brand bot. And I just thought that that was the greatest saying because number one, the agency that I was working for, we were very process oriented. We had, a, we had a trademark process and we were very systematic about how we went about things. And so it could get kind of impersonal. And so I think that it's really important to bring a level of humanity to everything that you do. And so that's what I wanted to bring in terms of my content. I wanted to bring an additional level of humanity. And so I would recommend to you in whatever it is that you do, whether that's an interaction with a client or an interaction um, with a coworker or someone in another department or someone that you manage or your manager, that you bring a level of humanity to it because that's going to deepen that relationship and people like doing business with people, people like doing business, like doing business with people that they know they like, they trust, no, like trust, remembered, recognized, remembered and revered. Those are my acronyms for today. Um, Berna, Berna asks, and I'm being ignoring questions up to this point. Um, Sorry, I'm going to ask uh, DJs, answer DJs. I'll get back to yours, Berna. How do you feel about taking out a small business loan or just loan from a friend compared to just struggling and doing everything yourself? Um, I would say I would be very hesitant about taking out loans from friends and family because money has a way of ruining relationships. It does. If you are confident enough or you feel like you need a loan and you're confident enough in your ability to turn that money of that loan into revenue, more revenue than the loan because you're paying interest on it, plus you're doing it to actually grow and expand your business. If you feel strongly enough that that influx of capital is what you need to jumpstart where you want to go, then do it. But if you're not, don't take it from friends and family. And what I would say is reduce your expenses as much as you can work out of your bedroom, work on a laptop. Don't buy a printer. Don't buy lights. Don't, you know, get clients, do the work, get the money, you know, keep the expenses low. Don't rent a space, you know, until you are prepared to grow, don't grow. 
if you need a small business load because you need to buy a $20,000 color laser printer because that's integral to your business or some sort of giant poster printer or something like that, then do it. But if you're getting a loan to like float yourself, you know, income wise for three months, think about it. Think about how you're going to do your expenses. Um, reduce your expenses first. That's my two cents on that today. Anyway. Um, all right. Uh, Berna. Do you recommend having a mascot for brands? Um, what's the best way to use it? Um, I think brands need a persona. I think almost any brand needs a persona of some kind. And I don't mean a persona in terms of a customer avatar. I mean a persona in terms of a face behind the brand. Some brands have no face, like P&G, for instance, who owns Tide and Febreze and like a Ivory Soap and a million other brands. They have no face. There's no face to P&G. It's a faceless corporation. Apple had a face, Steve Jobs, right? They have a new face, Tim Cook. They, um, giant, incredibly rich corporation, but there's a level of humanity to them. And so, but in terms of, you know, mascots, like characters, you know, MailChimp, stuff like that, you know, cutesy characters, if the brand warrants it, yeah. But I mean, in terms of, a must have for any kind of a brand. No, but I think that there is a level, you know, the Geico gecko, right? I think, you know, think brands can be built around characters, um, but do they don't absolutely need one. But I feel in today's marketplace, brands do need to have a face, whether that's a face of a, uh, um, a founder or a face of some sort of key brand um, uh, representative. Um, Okay, Val asks another question. Um, so, about the discovery on the phone with a client, how long should it be? How, how uh, Do you ask all the questions to do the work before sending an estimate? No. Um, discovery with a client, um, I, number one, I used to do like, you know, big full on proposals. And until I get a verbal email, approval of the ballpark price, I don't do anything in terms of developing a full on descriptive proposal. If it's a big project, you get a verbal on the estimate and then you develop the proposal to get the sign off on the contract and all that sort of stuff and the phases of work and the descriptive of the work and how the prices break down. But in terms of discovery on the phone with the client, discovery in order to provide an estimate, you can provide a ballpark estimate with a very you know, half hour conversation, you can, you know, ha have a meet and greet with them on the phone could be half hour could be 45 minutes, learn just enough about the project and the business to give them a ballpark price. Um, and then if they aren't scared away, or if they're excited about doing business with you, then you can, you know, write up a proposal to detailed proposal, get a signature. And, you know, on the contract, get your deposit. And then you have deeper conversations. I would be very hesitant about spending too much time because time is money doing deep discovery with clients. Um, do only the amount of discovery that you need in order to make an estimate. Discovery is part of a billable project. Like I bill for discovery. That's part of the process. Um, so anyway, hope that helps well. I love your avatar Val because also I'm a V right Van Dusen. A nice script. I don't know if that's hand done or a font, but it's very cool. Um, Cape Town says, sometimes I stumble on great videos, but you're the first creator who's taken the time to respond to my comment. Well, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you stumbled on me. Hopefully you'll go back and binge watch a whole bunch of my videos. You will be glad you did. Um, start at the beginning so you can see how bad it was at the beginning and then go, then go forward. Um, uh, Helen says, it's such an amazing feeling doing live videos. I've been doing live for a year so far. I never get tired of it. Yeah, me too. It's addictive, right? Like I'm kind of really digging this. I wish it was actually, I mean, and here's the thing. This is, sorry. This is one of the reasons why I'm planning on taking this to the next level. I'm planning on doing um, a, a, a mastermind group and um, and mastermind zoom calls. 
it will be, you know, a paid mastermind community. Um, but it's going to seriously up the level of value that whoever the people who join that are going to get. And also the, the level of contacts and network um, building that they're going to get. But it's that level of interaction and value and providing value and helping people build their brands and their businesses, entrepreneurs, creative professionals, build their careers, build their own brands. That really is what excites me now. And, you know, I forget who asked the question at the very beginning or a while back about, you know, why I made the shift to doing my own thing. As soon as I started to get that interaction and build my own personal brand and to see what content marketing was about and to interact and build a community and have this level of interaction, that's what really lit my fire. Like, I love this. I love providing education to a gigantic community. Like in my career, I've managed small teams. I've managed really large teams, like 65 designers and, you know, offering them creative direction, career management, you know, motivation, inspiration. I love growing people. I love growing teams. I love growing designers. And this is doing it on like a scale that's like crazy. And I'm, and I'm able to offer a much higher level of value to you guys in this community and touch more people than I ever was in the private corporate sphere. And that's why I'm stoked. Like I have the soul of a teacher and I, I love this stuff. Um, sorry. I'm just like, <laughs> you guys got me all excited there. Um, so, okay. Doyle, when you ask a question, it says right there on the screen, place your question, preface your question in all caps. Laura should be telling you to place it in all caps. Um, anyway, do you know, uh, when do you know, when do you know you should become a designer or not? That's a very personal question. Um, the creative professions are very sexy. Um, they're fun. They're very, they feed your soul. And if it's something that you feel like you need in your life to feed your soul and you couldn't be satisfied with just doing it as a hobby, then make the jump. And the other thing is that, you know, get an education in it, start doing it. I'm a firm believer in the fact that if you just dive in and start doing something for a while, you'll discover very quickly whether you like it or not. And this is how I judge whether you like it or not. If you can't wait to start doing it when you wake up in the morning, it's the right thing for you to be doing. If you find yourself procrastinating around it and like you don't want to be doing it um, or you're making excuses to why you're not, then it's not the right thing for you. That's what I would say. Um, Valerie, you're welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, Cape Town says your, your avatar is ace and that is very true. It's very cool. Um, DJ, I've asked, answered a lot of questions. I'm going to see if I can take some others. I hope you understand. Um, Rick, Rick asks a question again. Like I did my other video, I'm kind of headed on two hours. So my voice is starting to go. <laughs> so it'll probably be more around two hours that I kind of wrap this up. Um, but I, I have totally loved this as usual. Um, so Rick asks question, since most ads data are on electronic devices, what about animated logos or components via GIF or animated PNG? Tasteful, of course, but leveraging the devices. Rick, absolutely. And if you haven't watched my 2019 graphic design trends video, which has gotten I, like a half a million views at this point, um, watch that. Um, because animated GIFs, um, animated logos, movement in general, movement in terms of um, GIFs in um, email and logos being animated are becoming more and more predominant for that very reason. The fact is, you know, our interaction with brands is almost 90% digital these days. And so you got to take advantage of movement and 80% of website traffic is going to be video in the next year. And so movement is incredibly important, especially for graphic designers if they want to improve their skill sets. 
or if they're doing static design, they have to consider what their work is going to look like moving or how it could possibly move. Um, and if they can learn movement design skills on top of that, that's even better. But yes, you have to, I'm sorry, my allergies and my nose is really itching. Um, you have to take it into consideration when you design. And so um, watch that trend video because I, I articulate it a little better than I think I am right now. All right. Um, here's a video idea. <laughs> Philip Van Dusen's do's and don'ts of design. I like that. That's good. I'll write that down. I'll go back in my comments and I'll write that down. And if I don't, then, you know, remind me of one of the comments of my videos. Um, uh, Wizard of Crowds, first time here. It's really touching and inspiring how many things to learn from me. Oh, man, that makes me feel so awesome. That's why I do this, because um, I love inspiring people. Um, please preface your question. Sorry. In all question, in all caps. Um, Bridget, does a deposit on a contract without signing the contract constant agreement to the contract. Um, that's, you know what? To tell you the truth, I don't know that. I've never gotten a deposit unless someone's, I take that back. I have gotten deposits without someone actually getting the contract back to me, but I, I don't start the work until I get a contract written, signed. They can pay me a deposit, but until I have a contract signed for a project, I don't do anything. Um, short of a short discovery call and doing the proposal, obviously. Um, but that's what starts the clock ticking. And you only have to get burned once in your life to find out that that's the only way to go. Because there's nothing like getting burned for doing a bunch of work and not getting paid for it. But I'm not a lawyer, Bridget, so I can't say, I can't answer that question definitively in terms of whether that constitutes an agreement or not without a signed contract. Um, you'll have to ask a lawyer or go on some sort of law Facebook group or something and ask a bunch of lawyers that question. And please come back and, and report it, report it back or email me through my website and tell me, cause I'd like to know that actually. Um, uh, Grace, so good to see you. And Fran, um, good to see you too. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Theo. Awesome. What's the best way to advertise to get new clients? Um, I do content marketing. That's my advertisement. I share my knowledge, my skill. I curate content. I show up as many places and as well as I can. And my content marketing drives 60% of my new business. Just saying. Advertising, the difference between content and advertising is that you pay for advertising, it runs and then it's over. Then it goes away. And content marketing lives forever. Um, it's evergreen content that will pay you back forever. It takes a lo much longer time to get things going, but once you do, then it's just maintenance. Now, advertising, you know, depends on your industry, right? Um, there are industries that are incredibly competitive. Design agencies are, are a very competitive space. So you can do Google ads, right? Text ads. Um, but you're going to pay a lot of money and it's a very competitive space. So you're going to have to choose long, you know, key long tail keywords and stuff like that to try to leverage. Um, and you're going to be up against global agencies trying to get that ranking. Um, Facebook is a lot cheaper. You can also target a lot better. Um, if you learn about, a, a, you know, uh, ad targeting, customer targeting and Facebook, you can spend a small amount of money and, you know, hit a lot of eyeballs around a particular specific customer target that you want. Personally, I think that Facebook advertising right now, if you're going to pay for advertising, it's probably the best way to do it. Um, LinkedIn, I think they will get there, but their, their paid ads are actually really expensive right now. And I don't think their targeting is as good. Um, but they, um, I think that that will improve. Like Facebook has like gotten more and more and more granular in how you can slice and dice who your ad's going to be served up to. But one of the other things I've heard about Facebook is that they, you know, they treat impressions, you know, like 
a millisecond of scrolling up through something they'll say is an impression, like they'll rank it as an impression. Um, and so you can't trust their metrics, their analytics totally. The only thing you can trust really is the number of leads that you get for the money that you spend. Like you can look at their metrics and go, oh yeah, I'm getting 50,000 impressions. But if people aren't actually going through and contacting you through email, then that's vanity metrics. Um, so there's that. Um, Haley, how are you? Thanks for joining. Uh, tips for a college student starting their first marketing advertising internship this year. Yes. Awesome question. That's good. I like that. Um, Haley, first marketing advertising internship. Meet people, not just in your design area. Meet strategy people and account people, production people, um, and take people out to coffee. Let them get to know you. Find out what they do. Ask them tons of questions about themselves and make friends, get their personal email addresses and start connecting with them on LinkedIn. Build your network from day one. If there's one thing that I would do differently in my career, it is network more intentionally earlier and stay in touch with people over time. And here's why. And all you seasoned designers in here, you, you know this, but for someone who's just starting off, you have to hear this. Your jobs throughout your career are not going to come from applying online with a resume and a PDF portfolio. That's like throwing your work into a black hole these days. You can apply for 10,000 things and not get anything because no humans ever seeing it. An algorithm is seeing it. And unless your cover letter has the exact job description in it and you game the algorithm, you're not going to get anywhere. Your jobs and your career are going to come through people that you know. They are going to come through people that you've worked with in a company as a freelancer or full-time person. And then over time, those people leave that job. They go to another job. They do go to another company. They go to another agency. And suddenly, five years from now, the 15, 20 people that you knew and got to know at X internship are now working at 15, 20 different companies. And you're hooked up with them on LinkedIn. And you now know where they work. And now you're going, oh, wow, I'd really like to work at Pepsi. I'd really like to work at Coca-Cola. I'd like to work at Nike. And now I know X, who is in accounting, they're, in, they're at Nike. Huh. So you contact them in LinkedIn. You say, hey, you know, I see this junior designer opening on Nike, Nike site. And I know through applying online is like resume black hole. Can you, if I send you my resume and my PDF, can you get it on the de desk of the hiring manager? That's how you do it. That's how jobs happen because that person will forward your resume and email to that person and say, Hey, I knew this person. They were, a, they were an awesome architect at X agency when I used to work there. She's, she's cool. You'll like her. And they, then you have risen to the bot, the top of the heap. That is how you get jobs. Your jobs will come through people that you know in the industry. And if I knew that earlier in my career, I mean, I, I don't know who knows. I'd be the CEO of Coca-Cola. Who knows? I don't know. It didn't seem to hurt me, but, <laughs> but I figured it out along the way. Um, am, uh, Valerie answer, asks, am I going to How Design Live? No, I'm not. Um, not purposefully, just because my agency has been like crazy busy. And I go to a few conferences, um, uh, just a few conferences a year around my industry. Um, I go to social, I just started going to social media marketing world in San Diego, which happens at the beginning of next year. That was an awesome conference. It was my first year there. I'm deaf. I've already booked my ticket in the hotel and everything. So I'm going to be back there. So if you want to meet me in person, go to social media marketing world in, in 2020. Um, I live outside New York city. So then also if you're around New York um, and come into town and I happen to be in town, you can have coffee, whatever. Um, how is a great conference? Uh, um, there are, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of great design conferences. I wish I had the time to go to more. And I'm actually, as I said earlier in the call, I'm going to probably architect my own event. So you'll hear about that if you're on my email list, which is right here, right there. Sorry. Um, okay. Just a couple more questions. And I'm going to have to sign off. This has been awesome. You guys, I have had so much fun. 
Um, so if you have a question and you want me to get to it before I split, ask it right now and I'll do my best. Um, Grace asks, um, how do you best network in a pool of people at the upcoming How to Design Live? Um, try to find out like you did. Number one, that was a great job. Whoever asked me that, am I going to that? Because that's how you do it. See if you can connect with people before, like people you've networked with or in your network and find out who's going. How Design Live probably has a Facebook group of people who are going to go to How Design Live who are already starting to interact with people and network and figure out who they want to meet when they're there. Join that group. Um, Social media marketing world does that. They have a Facebook group where people start to introduce themselves to the Facebook group saying, I'm going to be at social media marketing world. My name is X. I do X. This is where I'm going to hotel. I'm staying in. I have a free night on Wednesday. I'm looking to get a whole bunch of graphic designers together and have dinner. You know, who wants to get together for an hour at break on this day and talk about how to get new clients? or how to do car content marketing for graphic designers. Just put it out there and then a bunch of people come in and then you know, you get together for an hour and sit around a round table and just chat and meet people. Um, so you, you gotta show out, you gotta, you gotta show up and you gotta find some of the forums where those people are hanging out in and start to introduce yourself. Try to make connections before you get to the conference is what I'm trying to say. And here's the other thing, I'm kind of an introvert. You can tell, you can tell the way I'm acting right now, but I am. And so in groups, I have a tendency to be a bit of a wallflower and it's difficult, especially in big conferences to feel out of place and to feel like a number and to feel like you don't know anybody. Um, it's really easy. Like social media marketing world is like a 5,000 person conference and it's very hard. It felt, it felt hard the bigger the conference is to feel like it's a more personal experience. But what I would say is, and this is what I've started to do is look for someone who's even more, who, who looks more frightened and out of place than you feel and go up and introduce yourself and say, hi, look for someone you can help. It's all about giving value. Like look for someone who feel, looks like you're feeling right now and go up and just introduce yourself because you're helping them feel a little bit better about being at the conference and you never know who you're going to meet. Like I've met some amazing people that way. I met, I met a, a person that I partnered with in a project just recently by doing that at a conference in London. So just an idea. Okay. Um, oh boy. Um, marketing Gatto, marketing Gatto, I think it is. Your question is just too big. I'm sorry. It's too big for, um, well, actually, Noel just answered it. I think that's awesome. What's the most important marketing strategies for a small web marketing agency? Um, I think, it, I, I, number one, I think that it's practicing what you preach. Here's one of the things that I, I blows me away about the, the, the graphic design marketing agency world is that it's the typical story of the, the cobbler's children have no shoes, right? Number one, design websites on the whole really suck. Number two, no one spends time with them. Number three, they don't seem to practice what they preach. Like they practice branding and communication and all this sort of stuff. And then when it comes terms, it comes time for them to show up for themselves and do what they pref tell people to do, they don't do it. All sorts of industries, marketing, otherwise online, small web agencies are harping about content development. But are they doing content development? Are they showing up the way they're telling their clients they should show up? I am. And it's driving business for my agency. But I am, I am one of the few, right? There's only a few. I could count on one hand the number of people in who are senior level brand consultants who are showing up in the content marketing sphere offering branding and design value the way that I am. And I'm sorry, I'm not just patting myself on the back. There's a few, I can name others, but you got to show up and start doing what you're preaching because that's the only way people are going to go, Oh, wow. That, that agency knows what they're doing. Can they do it for me? Like that's a great way to promote yourself. And so many agencies don't, they just go and pitch themselves and say, you know, I'm fabulous with our portfolio, but when it comes right down to it, you gotta, you gotta show up. Um, Brid Bridget asks, when will you announce your mastermind? Um, I, soon. I mean, I'm not going to say soon, like in a month, 
but it will be probably in the fall, early fall, late summer, early fall. I'll have it all together, maybe before that. But be on my mailing list because when it happens, you'll hear about it first. Um, uh, Mariana, thank you for joining. I'm sorry you joined. Um, I'm sorry you joined late. Brad, that's a very funny comment. I love your avatar, Brad. That's great. A sliced face. That's really cool. Great design idea. Um, and uh, so you guys, I'm at two hours. I can't, I, my voice is starting to give out. This has been awesome. Totally awesome. Um, thank you all for showing up and thank you all for um, the, all the great questions and all the feedback and all the interactions with each other. This is, feeds my soul. And I really hope that you're getting value out of the AMAs that I offer. I may start doing lives where I'm kind of doing it around a theme or, you know, uh, and I'll announce that, um, in my emails when I go live, um, that it'll be around, I'll be discussing a particular topic and maybe we can keep it topical. I would also say, um, in the comments of this video, if you have ideas for topics for live videos that you think would be a broad enough topic that like a lot of people could weigh in on, or might be really interesting or have a lot of gravi gravity around, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear those topics. Um, and so definitely do that. Um, because that would be a great way, I think, to build community around particular ideas. And it also shows for me, and this is, it's a little um, self-serving in the fact that it's going to be showing me what are the most critical topics for my community, because that will help me build the, the, the theme of my mastermind and the theme, it'll contribute to the focus of my book and also um, any other kind of training because um, I'm working on some video courses right now and I want to make sure that I'm serving uh, you guys as best as I can. So whatever feedback you can give me, that's great. Thank you to all you guys th saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for everything. Sheila, um, DJ, Bridget, Laura. Laura, thank you for, for uh, administering and being an admin of my comment section. I really appreciate that. Nora, Fran, um, no, Haley, Haley, go out and kill your internship. Hope you're still here. Um, and, uh, Fran, Grace, Doyle, Theo, Laura, Rick, Rick, great question. Um, and Helen, all you guys, again, thank you so much for showing up and I really appreciate it. And, uh, join the email list so you can get the newsletter the next live. And, um, that's it. Hope you enjoyed this. You guys go off, have a great creative weekend and just kill it next week. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye.